Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Pediatric Asthma Webinar Series, uh, put on by the Lung Health Foundation Provider Education Program. My name is Lana. I'm the curriculum developer for the Provider Education Program. And today, we are going to welcome our uh, speaker, Dr. Dina Radhakrishnan, who has presented for us um, uh, three weeks ago. And so today is going to be the second part of her presentation. Is it time to change the way we manage asthma? So um, just uh, to let you know that the first half of her presentation has now been archived and put on our website. So if you missed it or if you would like uh, to see it again, please um, feel free to go to Lung Health Foundation and uh, under uh, healthcare providers, you will find the education and it should be posted right there. Um, so, um, just before we jump into uh, introducing Dr. Radhakrishnan, um, I am going to ask uh, everybody, we're going to have two quick poll questions. We decided to start slightly differently this time, and uh, just so we can see, and also you can see where everybody is coming from. So, just the quick demographic questions, um, if you could just quickly answer for us. Uh, the first question is, where are you from? Oh, how wonderful. Oh, that's great. That's great. So the majority of our people are from Ontario to be expected, but we also have uh, some Atlantic provinces and uh, yeah, throughout the whole country pretty much. And even others, I wish we can see who others are, but welcome. Um, welcome everybody, that's great. And um, uh, another quick question uh, is, um, uh, if we could just see uh, what professional designations we have, who is joining us. Excellent. Excellent. So, so the, the, the RTs, RNs, nurse practitioners, physicians, kinesiologists, and pharmacists and pulmonary function technologists. That's wonderful. So welcome everybody. That's good to know. It's helpful for us as well. Um, so um, uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce or reintroduce Dr. Radhakrishnan. So Dr. Dina Radhakrishnan has completed her medical training and a fellowship in pediatric respirology at the University of Toronto and Hospital for Sick Children. In 2010, she joined Western University in London, Ontario, as an assistant professor of pediatrics. And there she led the development of the multidisciplinary asthma clinic at the Children's Hospital, London Health Science Center. Then Dr. Radhakrishnan joined Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, or CHEO, and University in Ottawa in 2015. So currently she is the director of CHEO Asthma Program and her clinical and research interests include childhood asthma, cystic fibrosis, as well as clinical epidemiology. So go ahead, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Thank you very much, Lana, and to Lana and Gloria for setting up those polling questions, because normally that's how I would start a talk to understand who is in the audience. Um, because obviously that's very relevant to what we talk about. So I have a bit of a handle on who is listening today, which is fabulous. Welcome everybody. And thank you for tuning in to hear about um, my talk today, which is entitled, Is it time to change the way we manage asthma? Examining the relevance of GINA 2019 in children and adolescents. As far as disclosures, I'd like to mention that um, I've participated on a few committees and organizations specifically within Ontario, Health Quality Ontario for development of our um, asthma quality standards, uh, the Lung Health Foundation, um, the Canadian Thoracic Society, I'm vice chair of the Asthma Assembly and I've received research grant funding from Ontario and Canadian institutes. As far as objectives for today, my hope is that by the end of the talk that everyone listening would be able to demonstrate knowledge of the changes in asthma management described within GINA 2019, critically appraise the evidence for these recommended changes in asthma management for children and adolescents, incorporate GINA 2019 recommendations into the management of asthma in children and adolescents where relevant. So this time I'm going to uh, start with some cases, some 
sort of made up, sort of real patients that hopefully highlight uh, issues and um, areas where the rest of this talk may become relevant. And we'll, and we'll circle back to these three children at the end of the talk as well. So Mala, the seven-year-old gymnast with chest tightness. Mala is previously healthy and lives in Ottawa. She loves playing in the park and doing cartwheels with her friends. But in the spring and fall, she develops symptoms of sneezing, itchy eyes for which she takes a daily antihistamine and this works quite well, quite well. But sometimes she still feels tight in her chest. She does not have any exercise limitations that the parents are able to express. Um, but she did have one emergency room visit for asthma when she was three years old. She's not had any since. Now, unfortunately, living in Ottawa, this is reality, there's likely going to be up to a five month delay before we can get spirometry testing to confirm a diagnosis of asthma in Mala. However, we presume that she has mild asthma and in order not to delay treatment, she is prescribed a short acting beta agonist, two puffs every four hours as needed during allergy season, specifically for the symptom of tightness in her chest. Moving on to our next case, Ming, the 13-year-old tennis hopeful who whistles. Ming is previously healthy and lives in London, Ontario. He recently started playing tennis just one to two times a month. He notices that he makes a whistling noise when running for the ball and he is sometimes short of breath. He has no nocturnal cough. He has not missed any days of school for shortness of breath and he has symptoms only when he's playing tennis. He happens to live in a house in an urban setting and nobody in the family or in the household smokes. He has pulmonary function testing done, which uh, demonstrates normal spirometry with no airflow obstruction. However, as we know, spirometry can sometimes be normal in the setting of someone with asthma. And based on this, based on his symptoms, he is presumptively diagnosed with mild asthma and prescribed short acting beta agonist, two puffs every four hours as needed, really as a trial of therapy. Moving on then to our third case, Jayco, a two-year-old wrestler with chest colds. Jayco is a healthy boy living in Iroquois Falls, Ontario. He is growing and developing well. His favorite superhero is the Hulk, and he enjoys wrestling with his dad. He's presenting to the office of his family doctor with his second chest cold with symptoms of nasal congestion, cough, and a rattling that his parents notice in his chest. On examination, he's happy. He's acyanotic, so there's no evidence of cyanosis or blueness. He's in no distress, but his respiratory rate is perhaps slightly elevated at 30 breaths per minute. And on auscultation, he has bilateral expiratory wheezes. Within the office, he is administered salbutamol, two puffs via a pediatric arrow chamber with a mask. And after 20 minutes, his wheezes have resolved and his respirate has come down to about 20 breaths per minute. Digging to get a little more history, it seems that Jayco has no symptoms in between these two chest colds, but his colds have been lasting about three weeks. He has no allergies, no pets, and there are no smokers in the household. He has had no emergency room visits and no courses of oral corticosteroid, but he did have an RSV bronchiolitis episode at six months of age, which was treated as an outpatient at home and from which he fully recovered. He is also presumptively diagnosed with mild asthma and prescribed a short acting beta agonist, two puffs every four hours as needed during colds. Now I will point out for Jayco that he had demonstration of reversibility of airflow obstruction or symptoms of airflow obstruction, that is his wheezes in the office. So really for this age group, this is how we diagnose asthma. So what is mild asthma and how should we treat it? Mild asthma means that the patient has a diagnosis of asthma. In other words, compatible symptoms of airflow obstruction, documentation of reversible airflow obstruction for children six years of age and older, or improvement of symptoms of airflow obstruction with asthma therapy, and no red flags for an alternative diagnosis. 
But in order to qualify as mild, these symptoms of asthma should be well controlled with no or only very low doses of asthma medications. So just to review our asthma control criteria, what do we mean? So if the patient is six years and older, they should be having daytime symptoms less than four days a week. And if they're less than six years of age, less than two days a week. And I, as I mentioned at uh, my talk in October, uh, there is a movement to change and harmonize this number of symptoms uh, per week to less than two days, despite the age group of the child or of the patient. The patient should also be having nighttime symptoms less than one night per week and requiring rescue medication less than two or less than four uh, doses per week, having normal physical activity, no missed work or school, and the severity and frequency of exacerbation should be mild and happening less than once a year. So when talking about treatment, of course, as providers in Canada, we would turn to our Canadian Thoracic Society Asthma Management Continuum, which was published again in the 2017 CTS guidelines, which actually focus on severe asthma, but just to mention that nothing about mild asthma management had changed as of 2017. And when we look at this guideline, if my pointer here is working, uh, first and foremost, we always confirm the diagnosis. Secondly, cornerstone of asthma management is education, providing written asthma action plans, controlling the environment that is identifying and limiting triggers as possible. And then we do have here short acting beta agonist on demand. And in fact, if you notice, and I actually didn't notice this until this talk, but there is a small section even within this diagram of people who are not necessarily recommended to start on inhaled corticosteroid, and that's within our CTS current guidelines. So this group probably would constitute those with very mild asthma, which can represent between 28 to 41% of people with asthma in Canada. So even though it looks like a very small portion of this treatment continuum diagram, it actually represents a, a reasonable number of people, in fact, a very large number of people if you think of the whole country. And it would be appropriate according to our existing CTS guidelines for this group with very mild asthma to treat with just short acting beta agonist on demand. The problem with this is that people with mild asthma may still have important morbidity. And we know that up to 50% or more people with asthma, in fact, have poor control of their symptoms and they may be at risk for exacerbations. I'm not sure to what extent this applies within Canada, but certainly when we look globally, if you're at risk for exacerbation, you're technically at risk for mortality. And there are unfortunately far too many asthma deaths reported amongst people with apparently mild or even very mild asthma. And we must remember that using a short acting beta agonist alone does not treat airways inflammation, but part of the disease that we called asthma is that there is airways inflammation. So really we should be treating both perhaps. So in order to address this um, sort of um, discord, if you want to call it, between short acting beta agonist only in people with asthma, even though we believe that they probably still have airways inflammation, the Global Initiative for Asthma in 2019 uh, revised their recommendations and uh, came out, sorry, I was just distracted by the chat here, but really I'll, I'll aim to answer all the questions at the end, but thank you for your question. Uh, the, the Global Initiative for Asthma revised their recommendations in 2019 to address this group of people with very mild or, or mild asthma. And they really came out with a ground shaking change in the way of looking at this. Now, just to take a step back, GINA stands for Global Initiative for Asthma, and is really the world authority on how to diagnose and manage asthma in all age groups. This group has international representation, largely asthma specialists, from multiple countries, including from Canada. GINA puts out a yearly update. And I'll mention that what they put out are meant to be recommendations. They're not really guidelines. They're not um, you know, the evidence that goes into putting out the recommendations doesn't go through 
perhaps as much rigor, at least grading of the quality of evidence the way that it would in a guideline. But really, they are considered the authority and, and most countries try to be in alignment with GINA recommendations. So what does GINA 2019 say? And I quote, for safety, GINA no longer recommends treatment with short acting beta-2 agonists alone. And within this recommendation, they characterize this group of people with very mild or mild asthma. And in GINA, they are called step one or step two as far as asthma severity. Step one includes patients who have symptoms less than twice a month. And it's recommended that these individuals should be treated with low dose ICS for moderal as needed. So inhale corticosteroid in combination with the long acting beta agonist called for moderal as needed. For patients falling within step two, which means patients who may have symptoms more than twice a month, plus risk factors for asthma exacerbation, they should be treated either with daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid and short acting beta agonist as needed, or low dose inhaled corticosteroid combination for Motorol as needed. So this is quite a bit of a change from what we have been doing until now. So, you know, we have a rationale for the change, but what is the evidence for this? Well, there were three studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine between 2018 and 2019, looking at Simbacort which is a trade name for budesonide for moderol, given as needed in mild asthma or sigma one. The second study is called sigma two, and the third is called START. And I'm gonna go through each of these studies at least a little bit to give you a better understanding of what was looked at, what was compared and the outcomes that were measured. I will also mention that these studies were funded by pharma, specifically by AstraZeneca. Now the GINA committee, scientific committee mentions this um, and they specifically state that because they were unable for several years, I think nearly 10 years, they had attempted to get, gain enough funding to do large trials of this approach to asthma management and were not able to achieve non-pharma funding. So this was because they felt it to be so important, this was the route they chose to get these studies funded. And I will mention that from now on, so as not to promote Simbacort, I will be calling this medication bud form for short, budesonide for moderol. So the first study published in the New England in May 2018 is called Inhaled Combined Budesonide for Motorol as Needed in Mild Asthma. The objectives of this study were to show that bud form used as needed is, is superior to terbutaline, which is a short acting beta agonist used as needed in terms of asthma symptom control. Second objective was to show the non-inferiority of bud form used as needed to budesonide maintenance therapy with regard to electrically, uh, sorry, electronically recorded weeks with well-controlled asthma and comparing the rates and time to the first severe exacerbation. So I'm gonna go through this in a little more detail here. So there were approximately 3,800 people included in this study. In the first group, uh, there were about 1,200 people who were treated with as-needed short-acting beta agonist alone. There were some adolescents included in this group, and what they did was uh, ask the patients to take a twice-daily, everyday placebo medication, so the patients didn't know if they were on a treatment or on a placebo, and then SABA, or the terbutaline, as needed whenever they had symptoms. In the second group, there are also about 1,200 patients, and these patients also received twice daily placebo medication, but every time they had symptoms, they were provided a different inhaler, namely the bud form combination medication. Then the third group was the inhaled corticosteroid maintenance group. Their twice daily medication, in fact, included an inhaled steroid, budesonide, and they Additionally, had their rescue medication, short-acting beta agonists in the form of terbutaline. This is just a picture of sort of the timeline of the study. There was an enrollment period, a run-in period where people were using only terbutaline as needed. So they came off of their uh, existing controller therapy if they had been on any. And then they were assigned randomized to one of these three treatment groups and observed with electronic diary and inhaler monitor over the total of 52 weeks. 
The main outcome I wanted to show for you in this particular study was the rate of severe exacerbations. And if you look at people who are on short acting beta agonist alone, their rate of exacerbations was significantly higher than people who were on the combination therapy as needed or the daily inhaled corticosteroid. Furthermore, what's interesting is that the people who are on the bud form as needed compared to the daily inhaled steroid, the rate of severe exacerbations was not different between those two. So the second study is called Controlled Trial of Budesonide Formoterol as Needed for Mild Asthma. To review this one, this was also a 52 week randomized, this time open label, which means the participants knew which medication they were taking, parallel group controlled trial. This study only included adults with mild asthma recruited from 16 centers in a few different countries, New Zealand, the UK, Italy, and Australia. And there were three comparison groups, the short acting beta agonist group, the daily inhaled corticosteroid or budesonide group, and the bud form as needed group. Patients were selected if they were between the ages of 18 to 75 with a self-reported doctor diagnosis of asthma. And if they were not currently on any controller medication and had used their as needed SABA at least twice in the last three months. So they had active asthma, but very mild asthma. Patients were excluded if they had been hospitalized within 12 months, if they had a more than 20 pack year smoking history, or if they had an onset of symptoms at greater than 40 years of age and had a smoking history. And the reason for this is to exclude anyone who might have COPD rather than asthma. The asthma, in terms of the main results, again, looking at exacerbations, the exacerbation rate in the bud form group in this study was lower than in the short acting beta agonist group by about 50%. And again, it was no different from the daily budesonide group, daily inhaled steroid group. And if we look at this using some pictures, uh, this picture right here, number B, uh, or panel B, is the annual exacerbation rate and panel C is the number of severe exacerbations. And to define those in the study, an exacerbation was if the patient uh, had an urgent care medical visit, or, sorry, an urgent medical visit to, to a physician as an outpatient or to the eMERGE, if there was a prescription for systemic steroids, or if they were using their beta agonist uh, much more than usual over a 24 hour period. Whereas a severe exacerbation was if there was a systemic steroid taken for three days or if there was an emergency department visit. So slightly uh, more significant than the exacerbation alone. And again, um, what we see is that in the short acting beta agonist group alone, the rate of exacerbations and severe exacerbations was significantly higher in the everyday inhaled steroid group or in the bud form as needed group. As far as severe exacerbations in this study, it's quite interesting that the bud form group had the fewest number of severe exacerbations, even compared to the daily inhaled corticosteroid group. So really provocative results there. There were some other secondary outcomes, of course, that were measured uh, in the study. They looked at the mean dose of daily inhaled or mean dose of steroid, I should say, budesonide steroid, either in the form of bud form or in budesonide. And the bud form group, uh, the as needed bud form group, took about half as much budesonide as in the daily budesonide group. Now, remember, this is an open label study, so um, patients were not as adherent to their medications as they sometimes can be in a randomized controlled trial. And their adherence was measured and found to be about 56%. This in fact is probably even a little higher than most of our own patients who have asthma. We know from several studies that adherence to daily inhaled steroids ranges somewhere between 30 to 50% probably. So it has a little bit of a realistic view, but even when patients were only taking half the amount of steroid that they were prescribed to, their daily dose was still twice as much as the as needed bud form group. Now, 
What were the negatives in the bud form group? Well, this group had more symptoms. Their asthma control questionnaire score was significantly higher than in the daily inhaled steroid group. And their mean fractional exhaled nitric oxide concentration, which is a measure of airways inflammation in the bud form group was higher than in the daily inhaled steroid group. So these are important outcomes as well. And finally, the third study I wanted to go through is the as-needed budesonide formoterol versus maintenance budesonide in mild asthma. So in terms of objective, this study was investigation or continuation of the sigma-1 and 2 trials. And the primary objective was to evaluate whether budesonide formoterol used as needed is non-inferior to budesonide maintenance therapy in terms of the annual rate of severe exacerbations. Now this was a double-blind, randomized, international, parallel group, which means all treatments are running simultaneously, and again a 52-week study. Patients in this one, rather than three groups, were randomized into just two groups twice daily placebo plus bud form as needed. So this is the as needed bud form group or twice daily budesonide plus terbutaline as needed. So this is the daily inhaled steroid group. Now this was a much larger study in terms of the geographic span. So 354 different sites and 25 countries. As far as patient selection, the study included those 12 years of age and older, so it did include some adolescents. And these patients were intended to have good control either with an inhaled steroid, a low-dose inhaled steroid, or if they were uncontrolled on a short-acting beta agonist alone, or if they had good control with a leukotriene receptor antagonist um, used daily and a short-acting beta agonist as needed. People excluded from the study were those who were current or former smokers. So this is a lo much larger exclusion um, compared to the previous studies. If the patient had received systemic glucocorticoid in the last 30 days, so a recent exacerbation, or if there was ever a history of life-threatening asthma, so an intensive care unit visit for asthma, they were excluded from the study. And again, looking at the main outcome of interest, which is in this case, not the frequency of exacerbations, but the time to the first severe exacerbation, slightly different method of analysis used here. And what we see on the uh, x-axis is um, really um, the, the number of weeks to the event, which is the ex asthma exacerbation. And the y-axis is the probability of having the exacerbation. For those of, our, of you who aren't used to looking at this type of um, display of results. And the top, the black line is the people on the everyday inhaled steroid. And the red line is the people on the bud form as needed. And the most important thing we take away from this is that these two lines are essentially the same. There's no real difference between these two lines. If we look at the p values 0.66, which means there's no statistically significant difference between groups. So their time to the first severe exacerbation was the same. Now, if we look some, at some of these secondary outcomes in this one, so this is change in pre-bronchodilator FEV1. So there are lots of respiratory therapists in our listening group today. Um, this is looking at lung function, of course, uh, change from baseline. The red line, again, is the bud form as needed, and the black line is the daily inhaled corticosteroid. So the bud form group lost lung function, so they had a reduction in their FEV1, more so than the daily inhaled corticosteroid group. And if we look again at this outcome called asthma control questionnaire, so asthma symptoms, the red line, again, is the bud form as needed group, and they had a higher score, so more asthma symptoms compared to the daily budesonide group. So how do we summarize these three studies? And particularly, because it's a pediatric series, how do we summarize the evidence in children? Well, as far as symptom frequency, lung function, and airways inflammation, all three of these were lowest in patients who were in the um, 
study groups where they were taking inhaled corticosteroid every day, which is the way until now we would typically manage this type of patient. However, asthma exacerbation rate in the bud form group was lower compared to short acting beta agonists alone group and no different than the daily inhaled corticosteroid group. Furthermore, there was a lower mean daily dose of inhaled corticosteroid in the bud form as needed groups. Now, how many children, quote unquote, were there? Where in, in two of these studies that included children, a total of 889 adolescents between the ages of 12 to 18 were included. So it's not a small number, it's not a huge number, but uh, something to make you think about for sure. So now what are we supposed to do? If we go back to the three children we started talking about, Mala is our seven-year-old gymnast with chest tightness. I, I'm not super accustomed to using GINA steps in terms of categorizing asthma severity, but if I were to try to do this, I would place her in GINA step two because she's having symptoms more than two times a month, at least during allergy season, so it seems. And she is technically at risk for an exacerbation because she's had an exacerbation in the past. It wasn't recent, but as you recall, she had gone to the emergency room for asthma when she was three years old. So according to Gina, she could fall into one of two possible treatment categories. She could technically receive bud form as needed, or she could receive daily inhaled corticosteroid plus short acting beta agonist as needed. And if you recall, we had prescribed her just the short acting beta agonist as needed. Now moving on to Ming, who is our 13 year old tennis hopeful. I would place him in Gina step one because he's only playing tennis one to two times per month. That's the only time he ever has symptoms. So technically he's having symptoms less than two times per month. And his treatment option would be bud form as needed. And as you recall, we had prescribed him short acting beta agonist as needed. Now I've put some asterisks here. And the reason for that is that these treatment recommendations are not currently approved in Canada. First of all, bud form is not approved for children under the age of 12 in Canada. So really for Mala, we'd be a bit pressed to use this on her. Certainly we would be off label. But bud form also is not approved as a reliever medication for people who are not already on this as a controller medication as well. So even in the case of Ming, even though he's 13, technically this would be off-label use of the medication. I just wanted to highlight that for all of us. So in response to this type of question, and in, in response to GINA 2019 in general, the Canadian Thoracic Society published this position statement. Uh, I addressed it a little bit in my talk in October, but just to repeat, if anyone uh, listened to that talk as well, um, this is a question and answer format, and it's a conversation between the CTS and the chair of the GINA Scientific Committee, whose name is Professor Helen Riddell. And this paper goes through really nuanced questions. For example, is there a safety concern if Gina is recommending as needed bud form in children every single time they have symptoms, even if they have very mild asthma? That's one of the questions that's addressed there. Uh, another one is, is it reasonable to uh, make these recommendations for countries where this type of use of bud form would be off-label and it's not currently approved by their um, by their authorities. So I would uh, certainly encourage everyone to read this. I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but as, as it may address some questions, there's one patient that it really doesn't speak to. And I think there's a lot of question about what to do for little Jayco still, our two-year-old wrestler with chest colds. Maybe I'm not doing this right, but I would place him in Gina step two. And in that case, uh, the options for him are to, according to Gina, either, and I didn't put this in the very first slide and I apologize, but Gina has extended um, management of step one and step two asthma into the preschool age group as follows. So they recommend that a two-year-old should receive potentially um, a daily inhaled corticosteroid plus SABA as needed or a SABA 
and ICS as needed. And what I mean by that is every time the child would take a short acting beta agonist for symptoms, they should take a puff of their inhaled corticosteroid as well. Now, this is really a radical change from how we recommend to treat asthma in Canada. And the question is whether or not the evidence supports this. Well, in a nutshell, at least in the studies I presented for you today, um, really it was only adolescents who were included in those studies. So it's a little bit of a stretch to extrapolate and say this would be the right treatment approach for younger age children and in preschoolers. Now, there are some studies that include preschoolers that have looked at this question. And in fact, we have done studies um, looking at this question a slightly different way to say that every time a child has an exacerbation, if we advise them to take their inhaled corticosteroid twice a day, every day during the exacerbation, plus short acting beta agonists as needed, is that sufficient for management of asthma? And every time we've looked at this question, the answer to that is no. And because of that, certainly in Canada, we have been really, really working to teach people to use their controller medication every day. And now here we have Gina suggesting that mm, maybe that's not required, maybe taking an inhaled steroid only when you have symptoms is sufficient. So this is, I think, where a lot of the controversy lies, particularly amongst pediatric practitioner. It certainly makes me have a lot of questions. How about this option, though, daily inhaled corticosteroid plus SABA as needed? Well, the question is, is this too much? I mean, little Jaco, if you recalled, he has until now had two chest colds. He has no symptoms in between his colds. Yes, his colds last a number of weeks, but he's not really having respiratory distress, perhaps a touch of tachypnea, but otherwise going about his life and not causing concern, certainly not ill enough to attend urgent care. And in that case, are we worried about side effects? Because we do know that daily inhaled steroids can have side effects, potentially growth suppression, um, certainly can have local side effects in the mouth as far as oral thrush. So what do we do? Well, I'm just about done here. I'm a little bit short, but hopefully there's some good questions. But all that to say, more help is on the way. Hooray. The Canadian Thoracic Society has put out a guideline specifically addressing this question. The guideline, in fact, is complete, but I'm not able to share it with you because it's still going through some checks and balances, and it's scheduled to be released in December 2020. The guideline specifically addresses very mild asthma and mild asthma and absolutely includes not just adolescents, but what to do in the preschool and school age categories of children as well. So to summarize and take home some points, what we've talked about today is a review of GINA 2019 recommendations for step one and step two asthma, which means very mild and mild asthma. We've reviewed the evidence to support the, this change in asthma management recommendations. And we've talked about how we might apply these recommendations in the Canadian context for adolescents and possibly for children. But the jury is still out as to what we all decide as a group is the right thing to do. In order to address that, there will be an update on recommendations for asthma management from the CTS, hopefully to be released in December. And hot off the press, it's not the press per se, but I've just been asked to provide a talk to review the CTS update at the Better Breathing Conference in January 2021. So I would certainly encourage all of you to participate in that and we can extend our discussion. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Ontario Health, who, without which I may not have been as informed about GINA 2019 as I am now. Um, I would like to acknowledge the Lung Health Foundation and to all of you today. Thank you very much, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Uh, this was very interesting talk, of course, on a very controversial topic still. So indeed, looking forward to um, uh, more information on that. And we have some great questions, which just in a second, I will let you get to those. Uh, just have a quick question to ask you as well. Um, you know, uh, today, the 18th of 
in November just happened to be coincidentally World COPD Day, which uh, so, um, uh, and, and we had a pediatric webinar scheduled. And I was just thinking that nowadays with a uh, world, you know, with a, with a COPD, uh, there's so much talk about early life exposure and they're looking at potential exposure in the childhood, uh, even in prenatal um, exposures. So I was wondering if you could uh, maybe reflect on that a little bit, you know, how, how would those changes affect potentially uh, developing or protecting a child from developing COPD later on in life? So that's, that's a great question. It's a really interesting and um, busy area of uh, emerging research. The, I think the short answer is we don't really know, but there are a few studies that come to mind that may be informative. So um, first of all, in a subset of children with poorly controlled asthma, we know that there can be airways remodeling. And this is where some of these ideas of childhood disease translating into adult and earlier onset of COPD, possibly amongst people with asthma comes into play. Um, the questions there that are you know, ready for more understanding are what is that subgroup of children who develops this type of important airways remodeling? And the second question is, if we achieve better asthma control in that subgroup, you know, by diagnosing and treating early, using medications like inhaled corticosteroids, will that change their trajectory? Um, the other interesting study that comes to mind is that, and, and this is not really exactly answering your question, I, I suspect, but, you know, we think about um, asthma in many children as being a disease that they outgrow. We think probably maybe a half or even two thirds of kids who develop symptoms in the preschool age group that they may outgrow their asthma. But there are some studies that have shown that when we follow up such children into adulthood, even early adulthood, many of them have a, a resurgence or, or you know, their asthma symptoms come back. So the question is, did they truly outgrow their asthma or were they in remission? Or you know, it's just a matter of exposure, you know? Um, perhaps initially the trigger for the child's asthma symptoms were viruses, but if that same child later in life is put into an environment where there are irritant triggers, if there's exposure to tobacco smoke, um, for example, will that kind of rev up their immune system again and they continue to have symptoms of asthma and the asthma phenotype actually never left them at all? I don't think that entirely answers your question, but sort of got me to talk about some other areas of my own interest anyways. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we have some wonderful questions here if you want to have a look. Yeah, so let me just go up to the top here. Um, so can I comment on how to manage the yellow zone in children less than six years and six to 12 years? What medication can be recommended for the yellow zone? In adults, you can quadruple the ICS, but not sure for the other age cohorts. Oh, darn. You know what? I had considered including um, a copy of our... Uh, Lung Health Foundation Asthma Action Plan for Children because it answers this question very nicely. But the, the short answer is really the only medication that we recommend adding in the yellow zone for all children is short-acting beta agonist. Um, what we suggest is rather than necessarily only using it as needed in very young children, that perhaps it can be used on a more um, regular dosing frequency, particularly for preschoolers, because by the time a parent is noticing things like tachypnea or shortness of breath or wheezing or use of accessory muscles, that children has been experiencing dyspnea, which is a subjective concept, uh, far longer. So what we usually recommend is that at the onset of an exacerbation, for example, a cold, that families start administering Ventolin or salbutamol, short-acting beta agonist, more regularly every four hours for that child. Um, I agree, we would not recommend quadrupling inhaled corticosteroid for the vast majority of children. And really the only other option we would um, consider is using um, systemic corticosteroid, but that really is on a case-by-case -case basis in children who are uh, prone to exacerbations. And I will say, I mean, I work at a center where most of the children I see have severe asthma, and I don't typically include prednisone or oral corticosteroid on their action plan, and I request that they call in for advice before we'd start it. 
Okay, next question. How much off-label use of ICS lab is being used in clinical practice in each cohort? For pharmacist dispensing, it is difficult to know what to be concerned with uh, when off-label use um, is there. That's a, a fantastic question. It's a really important one. Um, I don't know how often these types of medications are being used off-label. It'd be interesting to do a survey and see. Um, I can speak to our clinic. We do it all the time. You know, again, we do treat a group of children with more moderate and, and certainly severe asthma. I try to make it a practice to write a little note to the pharmacist, you know, if and when I can to suggest that I understand that this is off label abuse. I've had a discussion with the family and the benefits are felt to outweigh the risks. I think what's important is to feel confident that the child has not simply been prescribed this medication with multiple, multiple repeats without someone closely following for side effects, um, in particular, possibly adrenal suppression, depending on the dose and their growth. And with off-label use, um, we don't necessarily know if there may be other side effects that haven't been well reported. Now, I will say that as much as there is this, um, you know, uh, our, our current um, Health Canada approvals um, do not include children under the age of 12 using ICS LABA in the United States. These are available for children even as young as six. And there is another CTS update that is being um, considered right now, but it'll be a number of years before it's ready to really talk about the fact that there are a number of studies now that have shown ICS LABA to be safe in the uh, younger age group. And perhaps we should reconsider and we should revise our Health Canada recommendations. The difficulty is that um, you know, there may be less interest from some of our pharmaceutical companies in pushing this forward. So it may be up to us as users of these medication to push this agenda forward to make sure that our children have access to the best medications available. Um, the next question I see here, if I'm doing spirometry on a child to assess whether they've outgrown their asthma, should I order both spirometry and methacholine? My understanding is that normal spirometry wouldn't rule out asthma. That's an excellent question. So our practice here at CHEO, because we have such a, a, a problem as far as access to spirometry testing in our city, is we actually triage. If a child has not had a spirometry and um, bronchodilator uh, challenge testing, um, rather than right away doing methacholine, we will actually do that first. So even if the provider has requested a methacholine, we will do a spirometry uh, pre and post bronchodilator first. And if you see a significant response to bronchodilator, you don't have to do the methacholine. So I would recommend a stepwise approach um, before you know immediately ordering the methacholine. Um, I have another question here. This is great. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Would I explain the PRN dose of Simbacort how often and for how long for an asthma flare? Okay, so I'm not entirely sure what context is being addressed here. I'm not sure if this is in respect to Gina, which I was talking about today, or in respect to what we call the SMART approach to asthma management. As far as Gina and what I was talking about today, what the GINA recommendation is, is that anytime someone has asthma symptoms, that they should go ahead and take a puff or two of their uh, budesonide for motorol as needed. So really, rather than reaching to their blue puffer, they would reach to their uh, Simbacort or their bud form puffer instead. So it's not that um, it, the question of how long doesn't really apply because it would be every time the person has symptoms. Now, the second question, during an asthma flare, you're testing me a little bit because I'm going to say the dose is wrong. But if someone is on daily uh, uh, bud form therapy um, as a control or medication, then at the time of a flare up, and they are for children, it's really 16 years and older. We don't recommend this. It's not in the CTS guidelines as a recommendation for 12 to 16, but 16 and older, which is really similar to the adult recommendations, they would increase the dose of their bud form to up to quadruple, so up to four times. But now I might have to reach out to Lana if you can remind me 
um, about maximum dosing. I don't recall if it's a maximum of 16 puffs or a maximum of eight puffs of um, bud form 200 micrograms. I apologize. I should have that at the tip of my tongue. But eight puffs, um, eight, eight puffs uh, maximum of eight puffs. Maximum of eight puffs. Perfect. Perfect. So if someone is on um, two puffs twice a day, they could go up to four puffs twice a day. Is that right? Okay, I think so. Um, I might be wrong there, but but um, I can double check that. And in terms of duration, the, the recommended duration from CTS is seven to 14 days. But after that time, if the patient is continuing to need that dose of Simbacort or uh, bud form, they really should be assessed by their healthcare provider to see if they may need a course of oral corticosteroid or is there a pneumonia or something else going on. I hope that sort of answers that question. Um, the next question is how many Canadians die from asthma? How many kids and how many adults? This is a great question. Uh, the last time I looked at this, I saw a number of something like 250 Canadians die of asthma each year. That number is not exactly current. I think that goes back a few years now, but you know, sometime within the last five years. I don't know how many children die of asthma. Um, you know, yeah, I, I really don't know. Whenever it happens, it's it's news. It's a big event. Um, in Ottawa, we had one death over the last three years, I'd like to say, so it's not frequent. But we do still very strongly believe that any time that happens, that really should have been a preventable and avoidable occurrence, but I don't know exactly how many per year. The next question is, where does the use of Monte Lucas come in? Could it be added to the yellow zone? Oh, that's a very good question. So we looked at the evidence for this and felt when we were developing the Lung Health Foundation uh, Pediatric Asthma Action Plan. And, and amongst our group, our panel, which was, you know, some 20 plus 25 people, I believe, across Ontario representing multiple healthcare disciplines, um, and patients, um, people with, um, with asthma themselves or children with asthma, we did not feel that the evidence for use of Monte Lucas at the time of an exacerbation was strong enough to widely recommend it. What we were really trying to do was develop recommendations that could apply to the broadest group of children and were specifically relevant to the primary care setting. That being said, I, I believe that this is a reasonable thing to try Monte Lucas at the time of, of an exacerbation because it's supposed to have an onset of action within 24 hours and it could be considered and it really would be a trial of therapy and trying to monitor what the response is. Monte Lucas of course can also be added as a step up therapy for people who are on daily inhaled corticosteroid as well. So it really would be a case by case paid basis and, and a trial of therapy to see if it works for your patient. Again, knowing that there can be side effects from that medication too. Oh, and we have a confirmation that it's a maximum of eight puffs per day of Simpacort 200, so bud form 200 during an asthma flare up. Thank you very much. Um, so someone asks, is this for 12 plus and adults only? I'm not 100% sure. I might be, these questions might be out of order. I believe it's talking, the question is asking for the use of uh, bud form or uh, LABA ICS medication at the time of an asthma flare up. Is this only relevant to 12 and above that we would up to quadruple the dose of the medication? And um, my answer to that is, is that that type of approach, the SMART therapy during an asthma flare-up is actually only intended for people 16 and older, so not necessarily for 12 and older. If we're talking about the GINA recommendations, their recommendations actually apply to six and older. I believe it really is up to the jurisdiction as to whether that medication is licensed and approved for use or not. Um, there's also a question as to whether, I, I presume what I've been talking about today applies only to Simbacort, but not to Advair and not to Zenhill. That's a really good question. So the difference between, and I'm using 
trade names, of course, here. But the difference between Simbacord and Advair is the type of short act or sorry of long acting beta agonist that's included, as well as the inhaled steroid. The inhaled steroid type in this case is less relevant, but Simbacord includes formoterol, whereas Advair includes Salmeterol. Salmeter has a slightly longer onset of action compared to formoterol, which is within a few minutes. So it has not really been used or studied as a reliever medication. So these recommendations technically do not apply to Advair. Do these recommendations apply to Zenhale? So Zenhale is Momidazone plus formoterol. So Yes, the formoterol part could be used as a, as a reliever type of concept in accordance with GINA guidelines. But if you have a chance to look at that position paper put out by the CTS that I was alluding to, the conversation with Professor Helen Reddell from GINA, she actually addresses this. And, and in her opinion, I'm not saying I endorse it necessarily, but in her opinion, um, the safety of using Zenhale in this approach has not been studied and, and she didn't feel she could necessarily extrapolate to that medication. So the GINA recommendations currently only apply to budesonide for moderol. Can I tell us the name of the paper again that I was talking about the discussion between CTS and GINA? Um, Yes, I wonder if I can just quickly pop it up on the screen here. I'll do my best and just uh, go through quickly. Just bear with me for a second and I'll go back if I can. I think I can. This is the one right here. I hope you can see it up on your screen there. So if you are to put into your uh, web browser, the search function, um, you could put in either Canadian Thoracic Society, position paper, 2019 GINA guidelines, probably would come back. Even if you just uh, search for Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines and position statements, you'll be able to find this one. I hope that helps. Um, I have another question here. Too bad this wasn't in person. It would be really much more dynamic. But anyways, um, is there evidence or a link with maternal smoking and asthma in children? The answer to that is yes. Uh, there's quite clear link that has been reproduced in multiple different ways from mouse models to human studies to show that smoking while the child is in utero can um, affect the size of the airways and promote a wheezing phenotype in the child um, and, and, and uh, is associated with a higher uh, incidence of asthma in the child as well. I wonder if that's what Lana was alluding to when she was talking about uh, early onset COPD, perhaps being predestined from um, exposures that a child has in utero uh, or in, even in the first year of life. Oh, this is an excellent question. Will the companies providing Advair and Zenhale, do they plan to do trials to see if their products will be able to function more broadly as Simbacort does? You know, your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea. I, I suspect it may be in their best interest to try to do this type of study. What we certainly want don't want to get into is endorsement of a particular pharmaceutical company or a particular medication. And I did mention that these New England Journal studies that I mentioned from which these GINA uh, recommendations are based um, was funded by the um, company that makes Simbacort. So it puts all of it into a little bit of a you know, question. We have to be a little bit more mindful and a little more critical of the evidence, I think, before we adopt into practice, to be honest, which is why the Canadian Thoracic Society is doing this more rigorous, relevant to Canadians evidence review that will be coming out in their uh, guidelines shortly. So I don't know if they're going to do these studies or not. I would hope so. It would be really great to have different options, um, but we will see. I think I have like one or two more minutes here. Um, how often in my practice am I able to step down the dose of inhaled steroid because the patient is doing well, is very adherent and is doing good asthma self-management? Is it a fairly common practice or more rare because, of, because patient factors above are difficult to achieve in real life? This is a good question. I mean, our goal is for a child to have um, really no symptoms, you know, symptom free life and a, and a healthy life. And if they have asthma and continue to have asthma and haven't outgrown it, 
uh, it can be difficult to achieve without use of asthma controller medication. So it becomes a bit of a balance. Without a doubt, I step patients down um, and even stop their medications entirely. I do see a little bit skewed population of all the kids who have asthma. The ones I see certainly are on the more severe side of the spectrum. So um, many of them don't outgrow their asthma, but I do also see a, a large proportion um, in my practice who are preschoolers and many of them do. So it's really amongst that preschool group that we're able to achieve asthma control and perhaps they tend to outgrow their trigger for their exacerbations or their asthma itself and we're able to step them down and they come off. I can't give you a proportion because I think it depends on the type of asthma, the age group and, and, their, and their phenotype as to whether it's reasonable to step them down or not. But it is something that should be considered. I would recommend every six months to um, have a review of your patient with asthma and see if they can reduce the dose of control or medication and still have good control. Um, perhaps this would be the last one. What's my preferred inhaled steroid and ICS lava in the pregnant patient? I wish I could tell you, I don't see adults with asthma, so I do not have experience on this. And I think it would be a bit dishonest for me to just throw something out there. Um, I do believe most of them are quite safe, but perhaps I would request you ask a colleague who practices respiratory medicine for adults uh, to help you with that question. And I think that's it for time, everyone. Thank you so much for your listening ears and your active participation. It's really been wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Radhakrishnan. This is wonderful. Thank you for presenting for us twice uh, of, and on this series. And uh, uh, today, of course, the talk was such a comprehensive talk. So you, you were able to touch on so many different things in pediatric and adult asthma management. So very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so everybody, uh, thank you for joining. Um, we do have our next talk next week. Next week, we're going to focus on asthma and allergies. Uh, it all starts in childhood. So uh, our speaker next week is Dr. Susan Wasserman, who is a director of clinical immunology and allergy at McMaster University in Hamilton. Uh, and she will be talking about allergic reactions in pediatrics, the role of allergy in asthma, as well as new directions in allergy management. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you again for joining and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.